Gum Madda by the people for the people. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And good evening and a very warm welcome to Newsline Live. Um, this evening I have a guest uh, who will speak to us on uh, uh, the economy and uh, what we need to do next and what to do to stabilize the situation. But I have this to say. What has happened today is an utter and total mess. What is the meaning of what happened in Parliament today? MPs are supposed to sort this out in Parliament but are on the street protesting. When the people are protesting asking them to sort it out in Parliament. Any international lender would be, in my view, completely nuts to even consider lending anything to Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka appears to be run by no one. The other point, of course, is that Sri Lanka is of great interest to several countries. China is interested in us, the United States is interested in us, uh, India is always interested in us. But our elected legislators and some appointed ones appear not to want to have anything to do with running this country. One bunch said, oh no, you need to go because uh, you, know, you can't do it. And if you can't do it, go. So when the other side says, well, come and take it then, there's no takers. It's getting to be beyond a joke because it's clear, to me at least anyway, that our legislators are not even paying lip service to the people of our country. Remembering, of course, always that the people are sovereign. The people come first. That's the way it works. And they may have forgotten that. They were elected on a ticket of doing the right thing. Right. Well, they, item two in President Gotabi Rajapaksa's manifesto said that he'd sought out the bond scam. Well, to date, as far as I know, he's taken no steps whatsoever to release the 106 pages that the previous president, Sirisena, deemed fit to hide from the public and from parliament. What is in those 106 pages? Why are they so fighting shy of that? In the meantime, the people have really got so fed up that they got hold of a candle and their silence and appear to have made quite a dramatic change. Certainly uh, it, they made it feel a bit more shaky, certainly a lot more shaky. And no one in Parliament, apart from a few who said a few words on the first day, this is the third day since after the protest by the way, they just acknowledged it the first day just a little bit. Why? Are they ashamed of themselves that they couldn't do this and they're paid? We elected them to do that. It's really beyond a joke. And corruption hasn't stopped in the slightest. There's this attempt to continue to go ahead with a road project where the price they're trying to award is approximately 820 million United States dollars more than the previous chappie, the fellow below. And there's some technical difficulty on that. Normally, in national procurement guidelines, when there's such a disparity, they'd either talk to the better bidder and negotiate a better price, or they'd cancel the tender and recall it. But no, this government, well, I don't know if they are in power yet, but still, the government that was in place, um, say, last week, they continue to pursue this project despite the overwhelming evidence that this price is at 820 million US dollars more than what it was before. And guess who's appointed again in of the one or two members of parliament that were appointed as ministers. Well, you got it. Right, well, that's what I wanted to say. And, uh, you know, we acknowledge uh, the fact that the people have been protesting and the people have made 
uh, some form of change. It's up to the legislators to sort out this mess because instead of fighting amongst themselves for power, jockeying for power, this side, that side, this way, that way, this alliance, that alliance, the people are still waiting for a resolution. They're still without petrol, diesel, gas. I saw gas queues this evening. I also was um, delayed a bit because of the queues for, uh, for petrol and diesel because they occupy the roads. And think of the Think of the input lost on the economy with these people not being able to do their job but having to stand in the queues. This and perhaps much more, especially what we ought to be doing to stabilize the situation from an economic perspective. We've got with us here Professor Udara Piris, who is of course the um, um, advisor, uh, research advisor to the Central, Russian Central Bank. Absolutely. Very good evening to you, Professor Udara Piris. Thank you very much. Thank you for us. Thank you for having me. Now then, you know, obviously you heard what I said, the people protesting and they've, they're obviously fed up. And um, Parliament has uh, come back. It's the third day. But tell me, apart from that bit, which is politics, what should be done to stabilize the situation immediately? What is available to us to be done straight away? So uh, I think the first thing we should acknowledge is that, uh, I mean, last week um, we were all talking about an economic crisis that the country is under. I think what we're heading, what we're in now, is really a humanitarian crisis. And it may not be exactly this now, but in the next few weeks that's exactly what we're getting into. The hospitals are running out of basic medicines. There was an article saying that they don't have catheters. I mean, if, if the national hospitals don't have catheters, this is a humanitarian crisis. Um, my taxi driver that dropped me off was saying that they couldn't find Panadol, they couldn't find medicine for thyroids, and he was r running all around over the island to find this. Now, right now, people are managing to survive with whatever little stocks are available, but give it another few more weeks and people will start dying. So that's the gravity of the situation, and I completely agree with you that what we really should not be talking about is who is in power but what we should be doing. Um, so with regards to your question of what we should be doing, um, I think the, st the immediate steps are very um, straightforward and has been repeated by many other analysts um, around. So first we need to have an immediate suspension of debt payments. Um, there are two types of creditors that we have. One is the um, private bondholders and the other group is the multilaterals and the sovereigns. Now, for both groups, we need to sit down with them, explain to them the situation that we have, and give them and ask them for a few weeks or a month where we're going to suspend, but we're still going to honor. But in this period, we're going to understand the situation we're in. This gives us some breathing room on what to do next. In the meantime, we need to have our committee, so the president appointed a, quite a distinguished panel of uh, mm. three economists to talk to the IMF. So this committee has to go to the IMF and understand uh, how to create a very quick process by which we can get all the creditors on the table. So this business of like getting a short-term loan from Bangladesh, getting a credit line from India, uh, this is not how these things should be done. We need to have a one-stop uh, process where we get all the creditors around in within a week and we tell them and discuss with them what we want to achieve. Mm. This is not a situation where we have to be concerned about their welfare and what's in their interest. We need to present our view and what we need and see how they're willing to uh, uh, work with us to achieve this process. And that's the immediate thing that needs to happen. And once we do this, then we have uh, the ability to get emergency funding for this humanitarian crisis. And that's really where the, um, the, the additional debt that we're going to take in the next coming weeks should be focused on. And uh, we've just heard uh, the, a, uh, a uh, sort of release, a press release from the President's uh, media division uh, that uh, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe has been appointed as the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and KMM Sirivodna has been appointed as the Finance Secretary. Um, that, that news is just, uh, just broken now. And uh, is that good news that we've actually got a Governor in place now? Having a Governor in place, um, especially someone with the CV of um the new governor is uh, definitely a very good sign and a good step forward. Um, however, 
you know, you discussed, you mentioned in the beginning that the politicians in parliament are not coming to an agreement. And the problem is that the um, people's movement has been focused or targeting the president, which is good because we need a figurehead to target. But really the, d the discussion we should be having is what is the mandate the people are giving to parliament and the executive of what to do. And that's really the question. It doesn't matter who is in charge. It doesn't matter who is president, Absolutely. who is finance minister, who is central bank governor. The discussion should be very simple. What can we as a parliament agree? And there's three things that we need to agree on. One is where are we now? What is the current situation? Yeah. And the question is, we need everyone to agree that we are insolvent. The country is insolvent. So there's no point continuing to be in denial. Exactly. But there, there will be factions that will be in denial and will say this is a short-term liquidity problem. We need to accept that we are insolvent and we need to resolve this solvency problem. The second thing is we need to agree on basic steps to move forward. And these basic steps are going to involve restructuring, the involvement of the IMF and the need for fiscal consolidation. Okay, we don't need to agree on the details, and I'm sure you put 10 economists in a room, all 10 will disagree. And if you put 10 parliamentarians in a room, maybe you'll have 100 disagreements. Yes, but they might throw chili powders at each other. We carry on. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and the third thing is we need to agree on a time frame. Yeah. How long do are we going to uh, 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 stick to this agreement? Mm. How long do we need to wait until we get some basic outcomes from this uh, from this mandate? Then once Parliament can agree on this mandate, then you have this committee that we have this um, the president appointed three man uh, committee to give them the authority to try and execute this mandate to the best of their ability. Essentially, we need to have a process like this. I'm sure there will be constitutional legal issues which people can bring up, but I don't see any reason in principle the Parliament can't agree on this. And unless and until we do this, all we're doing is delaying. And every day we delay, there are people that are going hungry, there are babies who are um, overheating, and there are elderly who are essentially dying because there's not enough medicine. And so this is really not a time to be talking about who is in power. But they all don't want to be in power. Right. One side's saying, well, you wanted it, so if you want, come and show me 113, and then you, where you go, you can do it. I agree. And that's why I think the best thing in this situation uh, for, each, for the parliament is to just accept that nobody needs to be in power, that we just have a mandate to execute a certain objective in a short period of time. In um, my last... Uh, uh, presentation at the Face the Nation, I discussed what happened in Greece. So Greece had seven governments in five years. Mm. And I said that we're going to expect a similar level of political instability in Russia, uh, in Sri Lanka. And unfortunately, this is started in day one, or day minus one actually, mm. the political instability. So we need to have some sort of stability, some sort of agreement where work gets done. Hmm. And then we can work out through the political process who will actually be in charge and who will decide whether we raise taxes or reduce spending or all these sorts of, you know, technical issues in a sense. D look, y you come from an economics background. How difficult is economics? Um, do, you need, do you really need O levels? Do you really need A levels? Or uh, is it something you can just be taught and said, look, this is the basics? There's a, you know, as my teachers and advisors have always said that, you know, the principle of economics is a budget constraint, mm. right? You have a certain amount of wealth and you have to spend it. Mm. And I think that's the basic level of knowledge and understanding that people have to accept. I wonder, um, uh, pr uh, Professor Udara, I wonder if our legislators, members of parliament, elected and appointed, because we have that system, I wonder if they understand what most of our housewives and homemakers understand, that there is this amount of money and you need to spend, you need food on the table, you need this and you need that. And you know, so the housemaker, the homemaker will want to know where the income's coming from. So you know, if uh, if the income earner, I, I'm not going to say husband, because sometimes there are mm -hmm. uh, homemakers who are, who are men and, you know, and the lady goes to work. So they will want to know how much is coming in, because the rest of it depends on how much is coming in. It's as simple as that, isn't it? The economics, uh, I mean, you know, so the numbers might be different. But 
so what I would say, the one thing which has um, may perhaps caused a bit of confusion in the debate mm. is the idea that this crisis has been labelled a, a currency crisis or a dollar crisis. And? and it's not. What we have is what's known in the standard um, discussion at both academia and policy circles as a twin deficits. So it's a deficit in the current account, which means we import more than we export, and mm. these, in these imports include the payments of debt. And we have a fiscal deficit, which means the government is spending more than its tax revenue. And it's a combination of these two crises, crises which is reflected in the lack of reserves of the central bank. So. And I say this distinction is important, this understanding is important, because if you label this as a dollar crisis, then what is the solution to a dollar crisis? Let's get dollars in. How do we get dollars? We do a swap deal with Bangladesh. We get a credit line from India. But that's not the solution. It's the symptom. Mm. right? As any good doctor would say, we treat the cause and not the symptom. And so then we need, to, if, if you look at this as a twin deficits problem, we need to solve both of these deficits independently. Mm. But we need to fight them both at the same time. We need to fight them both at the same time and it needs to be done using very simple principles. This is an extremely complicated problem to resolve. We can't resolve the whole thing it in a few weeks. But we can get people food on the table, we can get gas into their cars. This we can achieve. And on that note, let's go for a quick break and take a peek at this evening's headline news from the News First Primetime News Team. We'll see you on the other side of the break, shall we? News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. President visits Parliament during crisis debate. People's protests increase across the country. Will Sri Lanka form an interim government? <laughs> Sri Lankan rupee plunges further. Healthcare workers protest against the shortage of medicines. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. I'm in conversation with Professor Udara Pires, of, of course, is a uh, uh, research advisor to the Central Bank of Russia. Um, now then, uh, thank you for your question, 0772-300-305, as always. Um, and thank you to uh, the viewer who's pointing out that Section 12 of the Monetary Act requires the recommendation of the Minister of Finance to the President to appoint the Governor of the Central Bank. Um, I, I suppose the answer to that is that um, uh, the, when there's no minister, uh, the, the ministry falls uh, under the uh, uh, under the presidential secretary under the president basically and perhaps he invoked that but thank you for a very interesting question so you you say uh, professor udara uh, piris that there is no easy solution to this twin deficits the current account uh, deficit and and the fiscal problem how do we begin to start um so I think the starting point and the easiest starting point is looking at the stock of debt. Mm. So the stock of debt is we have uh, dot debt in foreign currency and that debt in foreign currency affects the current account. Mm. And we have debt in domestic currency which affects uh, the Treasury's budget constraint, mm. right? the fiscal account. Um, so we need to restructure these. Now a lot of discussion and debate has gone into how we restructure um, the foreign debt. Um, I think you had Dr. Vijay Vardhana last night, mm. who pretty much proposed the same sorts of ideas that I would propose. Mm. Um, but one thing I would like to talk a little bit about is um, the problem of rupee debt. Mm. Um, I, I, th I believe a po somebody said a few weeks ago that we have a, a dollar crisis and not a rupee crisis. Mm. Um, so I would disagree with this. Mm. I think this, this is a consolidated fiscal problem and the rupee debt is 
A problem in the sense that when you look at the domestic banks, 40% of commercial bank assets uh, are actually liabilities of the government. Um, and that's an enormous number. So uh, if you go historically in the UK, the bank uh, after World War II, mm. uh, the commercial banking system had around 40% of uh, government debt in the UK, and that was eroded over time and, and was high until uh, the late 70s. Mm. And that coincided with a period in the UK where there's rapid economic growth. So wh why is this a problem? When the banks 40% of bank assets is government debt. They don't have any, sp any space on their balance sheets mm. to extend loans, to generate new projects, new investments. Right? It's completely under government capture. So this is, um, in an overall sense, the problem. Now, the government debt you can split into two parts. One is the treasury debt, the, the bonds and bills which have been issued. The second is uh, state-owned enterprises. So the issue of state-owned enterprises, Sri Lankan Airlines, Electricity Board, mm. is always brought up in the sense of the loss-making issue. Um, but the issue, I, the, I think another important point that we need to look at is their impact on commercial bank balance sheets. So around 9% of commercial bank balance sheets is state-owned enterprises. And we know that these state-owned enterprises are non-profitable. If these companies, these state-owned enterprises, were private sector businesses, these loans would be written off, right? So then you have an immediate fall in the asset value of bank balance sheets of up to 9%. But they're not written off because they're backed by the sovereign. So essentially you have this zombie lending issue that's going mm -hmm. on in the economy. And again, what's resulting in the deposits people have being very unproductive. It's going into government debt, basically rolling over government debt. Mm. And it's going into state-owned enterprises, which is again just being, this debt is continually being rolled over. So we need to discuss um, the issue of restructuring domestic debt. And this is an issue which is um, quite scary. And uh, you know, Dr. Kumar Swami uh, said last week that this is something we should be very careful of and I completely agree that this is a very hairy issue mm. but we need to face this and um, we don't want to uh, restructure domestic debt willy-nilly and this is because once you reduce the value of uh, government debt you're going to have a big impact on balance sheets of the, of the commercial banks um, so there is one idea which um, I would like to suggest which mm. is to create this idea of a bad bank Okay. So this was an idea which promoted in Europe uh, following the global financial crisis. So a bad bank is called an asset management company. Essentially what it does is it takes non-performing um, assets from the private sector, bad loans, mm. takes it on to an entity which is quasi-government um, and provides liquidity to it and in return the banks get assets which are liquid. Mm -hmm. So by doing this you free up capacity in the banking system and you allow the banks to be able to generate loans again. Mm -hmm. So by creating this asset management company which can take some of the sovereign debt, the rupee debt, can take some of the um, state-owned enterprises debt and what you can do once you've done this, you can put in new equity into the commercial banks issuing new debt, you protect the capital value of the domestic banks and then you ask who else owns the rupee debt, then you can restructure this, mm -hmm. right? So at the moment the problem in Sri Lanka is that 80 to 90 percent of government revenue is going to paying interest payments. And who would own this management company? This asset, this asset management would be owned by the government. Okay. Now, the tricky question here is who is going to operate and how independent that would be. And again, this is a critical issue where this asset management company needs to be run by professionals and independently, and it should be given the dual task of making these assets uh, viable in the future and also restructuring the, the asset, the um, state-owned enterprises. Now, why is this important? So there's already a debate among people about whether we should go to the IMF or not. Why? Because the IMF is typically known for raising taxes, cutting pensions, and downsizing the public sector. Mm. Now, if we, we have to do these things, like don't get me wrong, but we should be the ones that are deciding the path we take for this. We shouldn't be dictated by the IMF and how they see like the, ba the bottom line. Mm. So by having this mechanism in place, then we can use the IMF's guidance on how to do this in a way which is balancing um, the needs of fiscal consolidation, right? while maintaining our responsibilities to the workers of these uh, institutions. Mm. Uh, at the moment, everything has been failed from crops to services partially. How is this going to be restored at this, at this time? Um, so there is a problem in terms of uh, domestic output. So we have a, a drought right now. 
Um, we've had the problem of the crop yields uh, that have occurred. The we fertilization. Fertilizer, fertilizers, we have a problem with the exports of the tea sector because of what's happening in Eastern Europe. Uh, we also have a problem with the garment sector in terms of the subsidies and so on in Europe. Nevertheless, uh, you know, it's important to say there's many countries that go through these problems. They never get to the point where people don't have medicine. Mm. Right? Especially a country which is naturally wealthy, has a good institutional structure and at least on paper a good uh, political structure. So the fact that we've fallen so low is really testament to the economic mismanagement that has occurred. But uh, uh, whilst, whilst uh, I hasten to say that you know the public uh, knows this, mm -hmm. uh, that it is uh, a complete disaster, um, but what's the most immediate thing we can do apart from go to the IMF? Is that the best solution, go to the IMF? But will they give us money? Right, so this issue of going to the IMF um, is couched in uh, this idea that the IMF is a, a savior. The IMF is not a savior, the IMF is a partner. And this partner has their own objectives and their own way of doing things. But we as a country should know what's best for us. Mm. So what we need to do is to first have a plan and a mandate in place for how we should restructure our external debt, how we should restructure our internal debt, and how we should capitalize the domestic banks. Mm. Once we have this mandate, then the IMF can help us in order to implement this in a way which is going to be acceptable to our broader set of creditors. But if we go to the IMF and say, please help us, give us money, tell us what to do, we are going to get a bad deal. And countries have had a very bad deal mm -hmm. from doing this. But we need to take uh, the authority and the leadership to get the best out of the IMF. In terms of can the IMF give us money, they can always give us emergency funding. Our friendly countries can also give us emergency credit lines. But that doesn't resolve the problem. Yeah, it's all temporary. It's all temporary. We definitely need to do it. Yeah. But this is not a solution. It's not even worth talking about. Right. Because, you know, in basically, you know, if we have the new year coming up in a week, things will be okay. This uh, relatively okay for the next week or two. And then what? We can't mm. keep getting swap lines and credit lines. And here's another question uh, from um, our viewership. By declaring Monday and Tuesday's holidays, we are in effect shutting the entire country down for the next 10 days isn't this decision the word they've used is stupid isn't this decision stupid um, so we need to put this in the context of what's happening in the last few weeks so when you take power cuts of the order of 10 15 or 13 hours per day you're already cutting down the trading hours of many businesses so mm. GDP in the last two weeks has already been cut by up to 50 percent right Wow if the shops are closed half the day with the extra things maybe I'm exaggerating but there's a big chunk of GDP that's lost then you take 10 days off and then what was the economic output of the country for six weeks <laughs> right you have right. basically two weeks worth of output over six weeks now why are we talking about output output is people's income people are using the income to buy food and medicine mm. so I completely agree in the current climate we need to get people working we need to get factories open and people producing stuff. Mm. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, this is a political one. Is it for the love of country or to gain power that Parliament are fighting with each other for the last three days? Um, what does it appear to you? It, to me this is a, a natural consequence of the severity of the problem we have. Mm. Uh, it's very difficult for politicians to take leadership in this situation because whatever that what needs to happen is going to be um, uh, unliked by some sections of society it's going to be unpopular from someone hmm. and so it's completely understandable and this is what happens in many countries around the world we have this political infighting because they don't want to take the responsibility for the tough decisions one last question then professor Udar Pires. Uh, 2018 Sri Lanka customs report says that they earned 909 919.5 billion rupees on tax and revenue. That's 53.5% of government revenue for that year. Then why do we have to control imports stroke exports? Um, so I don't know about these exact numbers. No. Um, in terms of whether we should be controlling imports and exports, I'm of the view that 
Uh, what's been happening is that the central bank and the government have been using the current account as a source of fiscal revenue. Mm. And this is like textbook uh, things that you should not be doing. If you're going to tax people, you should directly impose taxes on uh, the source of income, mm. not in terms of the flows between the border. So we need current account liberalization. We need to then impose direct taxes on people that are earning money. And if you want to tax imports, let's tax imports directly. VAT, or you can put in a higher corporate tax. There's plenty of gimmicks we can do to balance it and leave the current account open because that, by meddling with the current account, is what's led to this Your reserve office. problem. Professor Udara Piris, thank you very much for that uh, quick explanation. Um, and uh, we, we really appreciate your, your time to come here and, and talk to the uh, sovereign people of Sri Lanka. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the wonderful primetime news uh, by our News First crew. And so I'll leave you uh, from Newsline and say, as always, God bless you all.